Um, thank you for coming back to us here this afternoon. Um, following on from the session that was this morning and also the first session, uh, the keynote, um, I'm really keen to take a bit more of a deeper dive into VR and AR. Um, particularly pleased um, and delighted to have two speakers here this afternoon who um, know their stuff, and they know their stuff quite well. First up, we've got Peter Dorkinitis. Mm, it's close. Close. Close, close, close enough. enough. Um, from Microsoft. Um, uh, and he's got a really fascinating um, demonstration, explanation of how some of this mixed reality stuff can work. And then secondly, oh, excuse me, sorry, Ron. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, we've got Ron, who is, what's your title now, Ron? What are you now? Innovation Catalyst. Innovation Catalyst, who actually is about taking the technology and putting it into practice and actually showing how we can use these things, particularly from a learning perspective. So I think that's, a, you know, we're at learning technologies. We've got learning technologies, which I think is a really nice balance. So uh, I know we've had a few people wandering in, but tough. They're going to miss uh, how we start. Peter, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Hello. I'm Pete. I work at Microsoft. And before I start, I just wanted to get a poll for the, from the room. Who's used like VR and AR and those kind of immersive technologies? OK, quite a few people. OK, it's interesting. So um, I'm going to tell you a bit about how we think about those technologies at Microsoft. And um, I should point out I'm not a HoloLens team member. I don't work on the engineering team. Um, I'm a technical evangelist work in the UK. Um, but I've been into this kind of tech for years. Uh, and I come from a software development background. So usually, I speak to developers. So if I get a little bit technical, it's all right. There's not too much stuff in there. So looking back to uh, you know, the history of computing and the how we interact with our computers, so human-computer interaction, we've had things like um, you know, console-based input. Where you type in a command. <laughs> You're smiling there. Are you, are you still using consoles? Yeah, so uh, you type in your command. Computer goes off, does some stuff, comes back, gives you the answer. It's very sort of, uh, you're in control, you're in command of the, of the computer. And then we kind of moved through to kind of graphical user, user interfaces. And I picked this one particularly for, for a reason. This is um, to some 3D software called Blender. And I am animating a cube in there. And notice how it looks very complicated. <laughs> There's lots of stuff going on. And I'm sort of jumping through this um, flat 2D screen to create something which is three dimensions which is a bit of a cognitive hurdle I need to jump through there. And you know, we're sort of firmly in the mobile era. Some might say it's coming to an end. We'll see. It's a bit, bit controversial. But uh, one thing's for sure, and that is everything is moving towards 3D, even my presentation, which didn't work there. <laughs> but, but bear with me, because I'll switch over to the PowerPoint deck for a second. That's Ron's deck. One second. So the point really here that is that this is, inside PowerPoint, a 3D model, which for some reason now I put it on the display doesn't work. Trust me, it's a 3D model. I can go in there, I can manipulate it, I can animate it. So the point is we're moving to this sort of spatial 3D computing paradigm. Second, back to presenter mode. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk a little bit about you know, the HoloLens. Um, people use HoloLens devices. You know, know what they are? A few, few people. And we're going to look at some educational use cases. And we're going to talk about how the device works and that kind of thing. So let's start with you know, how we think about mixed reality at Microsoft. So imagine, you're going to have to come on a journey with me here for a second. Imagine. We're off in the future. We've got some kind of maybe some contact lenses which enable us to mix some digital content with the real world. So along with those contact lenses, I've got a little dial that I can turn. So it goes from physical reality on one end. And as I turn the dial up, it goes towards virtuality. 
and you'll see what I mean in a second. So here we have a scene, we have a lady and a table, and everything in that scene is real. So now if I turn the dial up one notch, I can start to do things like introduce digital content into that, into that space. So I can put a, you know, a dog there, hologram of a dog. There's um, a, a mail app there, and a few other things dotted around. I can start to mix these things in with the real world. If I take up another notch, I can do some more interesting stuff, like I can have people from a remote location come into my space. And there you see the lady's now replaced with an avatar, because she's not actually there. Now I'm going to take the dial all the way up to full virtuality. And everything, I'm going to replace the whole environment. And everything you see now only exists in the memory of a computer. And you know, in that scenario, we can do anything. We can go to Mars. We can go under the sea. We can be in a trench in World War I. It's so you're only limited but really by the imagination of the app designers. Interestingly, we can dial, in, we can dial back another a notch. And we can do things like bring the real walls in the space we're in so we don't walk into them. And I think as we move forward, we're going to start to see things like um, you know, having your real hands inside these experiences so you can interact with digital content. So that's really how we think about these things. It's really a spectrum from physical reality up to virtual reality and everything in between. So taking that spectrum, you know, uh, one way you can think about it is that if we just nudge in a little bit from physical reality, then we've got something called augmented reality, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. But it's just, um, you know, you can point your mobile phone at the star constellation. It will tell you what the, what the stars are, what the constellation is you're looking at. But it's just really a digital overlay. There's no real interaction with the real world. And then as we move you know, across that spectrum, you start to get interactions so that you can have something like you can have a digital rubber ball, and you can bounce it off the surface of a real table. And as it bounces, it makes a sound of, of a bounce. As it rolls off the end, it gets occluded by the table. So you know, it looks like it's there. On the other end of the spectrum is VR. Okay, so we've got a device called the HoloLens, which spans you know, all the way from physical reality all the way through. It doesn't quite go up. It's not a fully immersive experience. There's always some parts of the real world involved. Some of you will be pleased to know that. Um, let's talk about the device itself and how it works. So it's a fully untethered Windows 10 PC that you wear on your head. Now, that sound, kind of sounds strange, but you can, you, know, you, can run, you can run Windows apps in there, and they will appear as you know, 2D slates inside, inside the visuals. Um, you don't need any external sensors. The device understands where it is in the world just on board, so I can take that in my bag, I can go to a partner's site, I can get out of my bag, it will just work. So how does it work? Well, it's packed full of sensors. There's, um, up there in the middle, there's a depth sensor, and that detects gestures that you do in front of it. So there's a couple of gestures on there, I'll, I'll show you those in a minute. And there are environment sensing cameras here and here, which work with the depth sensing camera to enable the device to understand its 3D coordinate in the world. Okay, so this is not a room scale experience, it's a world scale experience. If you put a hologram somewhere, it stays there. And when you come back from Spain or where you've been on holiday, it's still there. Now there's a webcam on the front, which powers a Skype experience. So if somebody calls you from desktop Skype, they see into your space, they see into your world, and they can draw in 3D into your space. So we see this power you know, remote expert scenarios. And there's a, a microphone array which detects speech. You can power the, the system using, using your voice. So let's move on to the optics. Quite interesting, the, op the optics. Um, you can't really go and buy these off the shelf. They're custom built lenses. Um, and the way that all of this kind of immersive technology works is that you have a, a different image for each eye offset by the distance between your pupils. And that fools your brain into thinking it's seeing things there in 3D. HoloLens is no different. There's a projector for each eye, projects light down into the lenses. They're called waveguides. And the light bounces around inside the waveguides. When it gets to the pupil, it's gated out onto your retina. So there's no screen in that process.
you might be asking yourself, um, now how do you how do you power an experience where you're mixing digital content with the real world? Now, when you move your head, if those holograms slide and don't update fast enough, then you lose the immersion immediately. So there's a there's something called a motion to photon latency. And if you exceed 20 milliseconds, that cycle, the immersion's gone. So how do you do this on a mobile device with a mobile, mobile CPU and a mobile GPU? Well, you create a new chip, I say do it. So that chip takes the data from the sensors, crunches it down into a form that the CPU and GPU can easily deal with. That's why it doesn't get hot on your head, which is probably quite important. <laughs> last, last but not least, in true mixed reality fashion, we've got some speakers on the side which provide you with spatial sound. So if I've got a lion behind me and it roars, I hear the roar from where the lion is. But that roaring sound is mixed in with the sounds that I hear every day. I'm not closing my sounds off. I can have a conversation while I'm wearing the device. Now, as, as the lion walks away, it gets quieter, that kind of thing. The sound starts to attenuate. So we see a lot of um, you know, recurring use cases with the HoloLens at the moment. I should point out it's a commercial device not being sold to consumers, and we target these specific use cases which give high return on investment. So notice education, training, and development is, is there, and that's one of the big ones there. Um, I won't go into too much detail here, but you can sort of imagine, you know, going back to the slide I put up earlier with the 3D software, what this, can, this kind of technology can do for creation and design, where you can have the models in front of you on the desk and you can manipulate them. OK, so I'm going to attempt to do a demo now. Had a few teething problems, because um, it worked fine. And then you all came in with your mobile phones <laughs> and ruined it. But we're going we're to try. So what I'm going to do is I've got an app on my PC, uh, which is connected to my phone hotspot. And that's connected also to this HoloLens device. So um, the app will show you what I'm seeing when I'm wearing the device. I should point out, it is a kind of degraded experience from that that you will get when you're wearing the device itself. Just bear with me one second. If this doesn't work, I've got a little video that I recorded out in the, uh, in the speaker room earlier. I'll show you. I, I can talk you through that instead. It's nice to actually see it, though, live, I think. One more, one more time, then I'll give up. OK, I'm going to give up, um, and I'll show the video. We'll talk through that instead. <coughs> if I can get back to the presentation. OK, so you might recognize the, the carpet and <laughs> the tables and chairs. It's a bit blurry. I'd say it is, is a much uh, downgraded experience from that which you will get on the device, because this is being recorded through the webcam. And the, the holograms are composited with that webcam feed. So let's just play it, and I'll stop it at suitable intervals. So I'm, just, I'm wearing the HoloLens. I'm walking over to the wall. All right, let's just stop that a second. So what I did there was a gesture called the bloom gesture. It's like the petals of a flower opening. I do, that, I do that, and the menu comes, and then it goes away again. And as I walk around, I've got this home menu there, and it will just follow me around. I can't get rid of it. It just slowly, sort of gradually follows you along. So I'm going to choose on there um, a tile, which represents the Holograms app. 
And I do, to select it, I do an air tap. I, I gaze at it, and I do an air tap. And it starts the app. And the app is a two-dimensional app, and it will try to hug the walls. Because the, you know, the HoloLens, HoloLens understands where the walls are in your room. It will try to position itself on a wall. I've placed it on a wall now. And once I tap, it will get fixed there forever. So the app will start up. And the app itself is like a catalog, and it's got a various different holograms that you can select from it. So you can see there we've got the ballerina. I'm going to choose the ballerina. So I gaze, again, I gaze and I tap. And the ballerina pops out into 3D. And she starts following me around the room, because I'm kind of about two meters away from my, my gaze. So I place her on the floor. Again, I tap, and now she's fixed in space. And I can resize her, make her make a full-size ballerina. This is really impressive when you try it. And because she is a, a volumetric video, I can play her back. Um, she's going to buffer a little bit. This is the, you know, the equivalent of your video buffering, <laughs> but in 3D, which is pretty cool. So there we have it, full-size ballerina dancing in the room as, as I walk around her. Not quite sure what, how I'm walking there, but never mind. What you'll notice is that the ballerina starts to become occluded by the chair. And this gives you an idea of how the, the, you know, the HoloLens understands its surroundings. It knows where things are in space. Much better when you do that live. And I'd put an astronaut up there to show you, but never mind. <laughs> so back to the mixed reality spectrum. So that covers that side of things. That's the HoloLens. On the other side, you know, Microsoft have opened up uh, the Windows platform to OEMs. And the OEMs have gone off, and they've built a whole load of uh, immersive headsets. So you can see them there. There's one built by Acer. There's HP. There's Dell. There's a few others. Um, but they're quite interesting because they've, they've got technology on them taken from the HoloLens. That is tracking technology. So what that means in practice is that you know, traditionally in the past, if you want to do some kind of experience where you move around in space, you've had to have external sensors. Like, say, with a Vive or something, you've got lighthouse sensors either side of the room, and it tracks your position. Well, these devices don't, don't need those external sensors. They do the tracking from on board on the cameras. So what this means in practice is that, you know, you don't, you're not tethered to a particular room. You can move around. It's really very convenient. You can take these things. I could, could have brought a laptop with me today with a, one of these immersive headsets and plugged it in and shown you. Along with those come some hand controllers. They're like your tools. You know, If you want to create something in, in VR, you can use these kind of hand controllers to do it, some painting or making 3D objects. And again, you notice an LED constellation pattern around the top ring. It's being tracked optically, optically by cameras on the headsets. So it's quite a lot different to some of the headsets we've seen in the past. You can also use an Xbox controller. And you know, I've put this slide here. I'm not going to talk much about it. But really, the key takeaway, for me anyway at least, is that nobody else has a platform which spans this whole spectrum. Um, so it's kind of like a key USP for, for Microsoft's mixed reality platform, I suppose. Uh, it's great for building apps, because you build for one, and it's, it works on the other. Obviously, the, you know, the experience is going to be quite a lot different when you can see the real world and when you can't. But um, you get the idea. So I've got the same demo. This time, I, I videoed it in, in advance anyway, because I didn't want to bring the, the, the laptop with me. Oh, I, I couldn't fit it, fit it in the bag. So. So I put on my immersive, I plug it into my PC, I put on my immersive headset, and I'm in a, the clifftop house, which is like your desktop, but it's in 3D. So you can pin up apps around there and all sorts of things. And here I'm just running through the sort of training um, app that is on, on that device. So I can teleport around the space. I can walk around and move my head and that kind of thing. I can use the same app that I just showed you on the HoloLens, the Holograms app. I can get a hologram out. I can position it. I can scale it. and I can. I can do stuff there with it. There's the astronaut. Hello. Let's see if we wave back to it. PCs. Now, the spec of the PCs, I mean, it's an interesting thing, because um, traditionally, you know, you need a big, a huge gaming PC to run your virtual reality experiences. It's quite expensive. But the specs of those things are coming down, coming down pretty fast, I'll say. So with the Windows stuff, you can. Um, there are two modes it has. So you can run at 90 hertz uh, with a discrete GPU. 
or you can use of onboard graphics in something like you know, Surface Book and run things like 360 videos. It sort of supports them across the board. It will drop down to 60 frames a second for the video. There's a whole load of stuff on there. You can go to the website if you're interested. Now, interestingly, those uh, example of the headset there, and that says £379 including controllers, which seems to me quite low already, but you can get really good deals on Amazon at the moment, I notice. And uh, you know, the OEM sites you can go to, to buy those headsets. For the HoloLens, that's available at the Microsoft Store. There's pricing on that. It's not consumer pricing, but it comes in two SKUs. There's a developer SKU and a commercial SKU. The idea is that you buy a couple of developer SKUs, the developers build a proof of concept, and then they, if they want to roll it out into the company or to their organization, then they buy some uh, commercial devices. And they sort of support you know, BitLocker and, and all these things that you need inside a, or an organization to roll stuff out. Now, good timing, because there's a promotion at the moment. So if you do want to buy a HoloLens, you can get 10% off for educational organizations. All of the details are on that, on that link to find out what, what qualifies as an educational organization, that kind of thing. But building apps, you know, it's often what I talk about a lot. I just want to, uh, I'm not sure how much interest there is in building apps here, but I'm just going to say what options are available. So you can build this stuff yourself. If you're a developer, you can go, there's a whole load of tutorials, academy videos, there's everything you need online to help you get started with that. We've got a partner program. It's a worldwide partner program where we say these people can build these kinds of apps. So we kind of endorse them. Um, build with Microsoft, in some cases you, you can build with Microsoft and sometimes there's investment to be made there and sometimes there isn't. Um, if you're interested in that, come speak to me afterwards and we can talk about that. We see more and more often now the HoloLens has been around for a while. We're starting to see you know, off the shelf um, experiences, um, particularly in education. We'll talk about some of those in a second. Oh, I'm gonna talk about them now. Education use case studies. So the first one I wanna talk about is Case Western Reserve University. So sometime fairly recently, they built a new state of the art premises in Cleveland, Ohio. And you know, they, they, um, they build courses around HoloLens. So as an example of that, you know, in their typical um, uh, space, they would have a laboratory, which would have uh, facilities for cadavers, and they've done away with all of that, and they're using HoloLens instead for all of this stuff. And I, I, I can't explain it very well, but I'm gonna roll a video uh, where they explain it very well, so. We've been teaching human anatomy the same way for 100 years. Students get a cadaver, then they look at medical illustrations, and it's completely two-dimensional, and the human body isn't. Microsoft HoloLens is a holographic computer that you wear. It enables you to bring your digital world into your real world. At Case Western Reserve University, we are focused on solving problems and creating new knowledge. My job is to teach, and I really think this could impact almost everything that we teach people. With HoloLens, you can see the muscles on top of the skeleton all at the same time. You can bring them in and out and exactly understand where things sit. You can take any anatomical part and show any of it. You can move it around, you can make it kind of translucent so you can see through the outside, and that really helped me understand like how cardiac anatomy worked. I actually had a moment where I found the aortic valve, and it was the first time that I'd actually seen the aortic valve in relation to all the other anatomical structures. You know, it was a way of seeing it that you couldn't do with an actual heart. I think this will improve students' confidence in learning anatomy dramatically. By creating simulations with the HoloLens that lets them have an experience where they can fail, that would be the best way to learn because we don't allow people to fail too much in real life medicine. With HoloLens, you could imagine having a class standing around a model, almost like a tour group in a museum, where they're all interacting completely naturally. I spend a huge amount of time to make sure they become the best professionals because it's all of our jobs to make the world a better place. 
working with Case Western Reserve University to create this paradigm shift so that we can leap together with students into the future of education. We believe that HoloLens is going to enable us to do that. We talked about being able to use it to teach art history. We have an anthropology department too that I think will enjoy this technology. Anytime you change the way that you see things, it changes the way that you understand them. As soon as you can change somebody's understanding, then they can change the way they see the world. So I hope that kind of resonates a little bit with you because I, I've, um, I recently did an experience on the HoloLens, which was a shared experience. So I, I stood around with six other people and we all looked at the same hologram. And uh, as one interacted with it, the others would see what they were doing. So it was, it was like there was just digital stuff in our space. And um, the app showed a medical procedure. So it sh showed an open knee surgery. And it showed how to administer a certain drug into the knee. And um, you know, I've got a really vivid memory of, of, of doing that. And I sort of felt afterwards that I could actually done that procedure, although <laughs> maybe that's pushing it a little bit too far. But it's nice to know that when you, you know, you're in an operating theater, the surgeon has at least had some practice with something. <laughs> if, you know, cadavers can be quite expensive. So this uh, can show maybe a, a great return on investment for those use cases. Pearson. Pearson are building apps for the HoloLens. They've got a whole range of them coming out this year. Um, let's have a look at a couple of them. So Holo History, Holo Patient, Holo Chemistry. The one that resonated with me, I put it up on the slide, is Holo Maths. You know, imagine trying to sort of understand 3D maths and your, your lecturer is kind of drawing on this 2D board. So again, it's this kind of cognitive leap. You know, you're, you're hoping your, your lecturer is a good 3D artist in, in this scenario. But you can have these things in front of you and you can, you know, you can experience them. You can experience the equations right there. And the last one I wanted to take a quick look at is Lifelike. So they've got an app in the Windows Store. If you've got a HoloLens, you can just go and load it up and uh, they're building um, educational apps. So again, I've got a video, I hope I'm gonna run this and um, hopefully this resonates too. Being able to bring in something like HoloLens with mixed reality or something that lifelike is done with 3D objects helps us educate kids in a different way. So in Lifelike, I make sure that we really create tools for learning and teaching. We've been creating interactive 3D models for years now. Lifelike gives teachers and educators, students, the ability to look at objects in multiple different dimensions. So instead of looking at a flat image in a textbook or on a picture, you can see it and rotate it. You can look at how it compares in scale and size. Our mixed reality experience is something that brings learning even farther. It was really cool. <laughs> like I was able to actually look around and not just look at a flat picture. You could like walk around and it was actually there. It felt like it was actually there. The visual aspect, the interaction with the lifelike models was also something that made explaining difficult topics much easier for students. Even with the textbook, we couldn't take them to the inside of a cell. We couldn't have them look at the circulatory system in the same way. I was looking at a blood vessel and blood components. With the 3D, you could walk around, and then you could see like the back, the top, and you could like, look at it from different perspectives. But you can understand what you're looking at better. So we really wanted to make sure that the app, that this learning experience goes way beyond just a cool effect, but that it really brings the real value in the classroom. I think that it makes like learning fun. A lot of kids come to school and they kind of dread school, but um, I think this will make learning really fun and kind of like you, you want to do it. There are students in all of our classrooms who have passions that aren't covered in the traditional curriculum. But things like HoloLens can start getting kids excited about looking at the intersections of art and technology, of coding, and how those are used in industries. The future of technology and education is incredibly exciting, not only for researchers and teachers, but for students.
So that's it for me. If you want any more information, you can go to hollands.com. Um, if you're interested in just in, in the uh, technology in general, follow me on Twitter, I'm always tweeting about this stuff. Or you can, if you're interested in maybe doing a project with Microsoft, you can find me on LinkedIn. Be around for the rest of the day if anybody wants to chat about any of this stuff. Otherwise, I'm going to hand over to Ron. So. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Are we going to do question, questions at the end? We'll do questions at the end, but okay. if you can just, I'll just put the I'll be thing over. I've got one question, though, actually, for you, Pete. Yep. So in terms of limiting, you said you couldn't bring the bigger technology with you because it didn't fit in the bag. Does that limit how we could use this in the future, then? Because if you can't bring it here... Well, um, it, obviously, in the future, these things will start to miniaturize. I, I could have bought it here. Right. It, it's the point. I think I was trying to make that point, and then I destroyed my own point, <laughs> which is a bit stupid. But uh, I've got a lot of stuff in that bag. Oh, right. That's the point. Okay. But, but um, what I'm talking about is a gaming laptop. So it's quite a lot thicker than my <laughs> Surface Book. Um, but I just need that, and I need the headset and the controllers. Right. So it's very portable, in okay. actual fact. Cool. OK. Thank you. Um, so we've seen what the technology can do. I've got some more questions that I will ask you. Um, think of the questions that you might have as well. Um, but hand you over to Ron, because um, I'm just keen to see how Ron takes maybe some of those ideas and well, actually what they look like in terms of workplace learning. So Ron, over to you. Great, thank you. Hello, everybody. How are we doing? Good, hanging in there. I'm uh, really excited to be here and talk with you, I'll share a little bit about myself and then talk, um, of course, about AR and VR and talk more about corporate uh, L&D uh, applications of these cool technologies. And just a little bit about me, I've uh, been in the L&D industry since 26 years, both as a, as a buyer and supplier, if you will. Always passionate about applying emerging technologies into the workplace for both learning and performance. Uh, I've been building augmented reality uh, solutions for about 12 years in virtual reality and Microsoft HoloLens uh, applications for the last couple years. And uh, what I want to do today is share some, some tips, some lessons learned along the way, and certainly some things not to do, if, uh, and hopefully that'll be helpful. And um, so we talked, um, uh, Pete, Pete talked a lot about um, the HoloLens as mixed reality. Let's talk a little bit about VR. And um, I'm sure a lot of you have tried VR and you've seen a lot uh, downstairs as well. Why is VR so hot right now? You see VR uh, everywhere. You see it in, uh, in, in gas petrol stations. You see it for sale. Uh, bundle it in with your gas for, for fiber. You see it in, in Primark. You see it in um, uh, little kiosks. You see it, uh, of course, in the high-end stores in terms of the hardware. Uh, the hardware is everywhere. And you're starting to see more consumer apps and certainly games on it. What's that have to do with us? Why should we even be worried about it or concerned about it or looking into it from an L&D perspective? What I'm going to show you here is a, a little video clip of, uh, that helps make a great point about what's so different about VR. So we've been doing immersive 3D stuff on laptops forever. What is it about VR that it brings to the table? So in this clip is uh, from a, a game show in, I think, Japan a couple years ago. And um, let's let it play for a little bit here. So these are people at a trade show, at a gamer show, trying this VR for the first time. Set up a, a plank along the ground, and you go up 30 stories. Hey, Detoiters, it's Nero, and I'm in Tokyo, and I'm gonna be playing some VR games. You have a sensor on each hand. Uh huh. You have a VR headset, and you track his feet. I think it's mean they moved the cat out. But he did it. Look how slow he's moving. <laughs> the important
important safety tip. <laughs> Oh my god, that was really scary. <laughs> Let's play a little bit of this one. Okay. You get the idea. Eventually, she does get on the board. They know that they're you know, in a trade show on a floor, and they know there's a little wooden plank there. But it's so realistic, it causes that kind of emotional reaction, that kind of engagement. And that's what's so different about VR. It's totally immersive, totally engage you at an emotional level. It could be scary. It could also be really fun. So when you want to be somewhere else or be someone else, be transported, it has great application. And it's totally, a totally different experience. And um, so that's a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. What are some of the applications of this really immersive tech? You can find this clip yourself. You tap uh, cat and skyscraper into, and VR into, into uh, YouTube. You'll find it. Let's go back to the deck. Oops. There we go. Um, so that was a couple years ago. Now uh, a game's been out for a bit on the Vive and I think other platforms called Richie's Plank and it's essentially the same thing. And uh, my former uh, uh, studio I was working for or with, and we had this uh, set up in addition to our own demos, let people have a go on this. And it's essentially the same thing. Uh, one of the gals tried it on after seeing her coworkers try it and kind of struggle a bit. She goes, I can do it. She put on the headset. Remember, this is tethered. It's wired just like theirs were. Um, and she ran, just started running right into a, a wall. <laughs> she knows she's in our studio, and yet puts it on. And uh, well, that's how transported she was. Anyway, it turns out she was OK. Uh, which is which is good. Um, so there's a lot of hype in, in VR and AR, and in fact now they're always talked about together, and they're, they're quite different technologies. We'll, we'll go into a bit of that. So you know when Gartner is saying that it's going to be the biggest thing since sliced cheese in uh, in the next couple of years, you know, we're at the pinnacle of hype. And and here this is a brand new uh, article that they've come out with. Um, that uh, just, if you can read that there, 20% of enterprises are going to be doing something in AR, MR, or VR in uh, in, in just the next year. So that's, that's huge. And a lot of you have already tried it. A lot of your organizations are already adopting or at least trialing uh, either AR, VR, or maybe both, and, and maybe outside of L&D. And this next article, or next um, publication here, HBR, uh, this is last month, uh, really goes into depth about enterprise applications of AR. So I suggest that you find that it's free to download. Uh, it's co-authored by Michael Porter, uh, you may have heard of, and um, the CEO of Euphoria, which is one of the leading uh, AR platforms uh, out there. Um, so I would really recommend that you check that out. But if the mainstream business press is starting to cover this, also something recently out in Forbes, uh, you know that there's something to it. And what uh, the, the small text there says is why every organization needs an AR strategy. So your CIOs, this type of information, and your business leaders um, that, they're, uh, that they're looking at and reading, uh, there might be business traction or should be business traction in your organizations even beyond L&D. And it might be a way for you to, uh, to work with your colleagues um, to, to create both learning and performance applications with them. If you download that article, um, there's also a free app that goes with it. And this is a great way to experiment with, with AR. I was just pointing it at my laptop screen. Uh, it could be the print or the laptop. And up pops this 3D um, 
a little map, a little animated robot, and that little slider in the upper right or upper left uh, you can interact with. And one of the things I liked about this article, well, a lot of the examples in there are a couple years old, I think, and the uh, main applications of AR, as they're saying, is about visualizing data, so you, that's easy, giving instructions, so that ties into L&D, um, and be able to interact, so entire new interfaces to different kinds of kit um, are, are supported by AR. And what I liked about this article is that they also said, oh, and VR gives you that fourth thing, and that's simulation. And, uh, and I've, I've found that to be true uh, as well, of, and a differentiator uh, between the two. So these are some of the different things that I wanted to, to cover off today with you. Uh, what's the range of this hardware that we're talking about, and what are some of the different benefits um, that, uh, of using the different types? What are some of the, the trade-offs between them? Um, and, and how is L&D using this? And uh, a lot of the work that I did over the last couple of years was using this in a classroom. So I want to share some lessons learned uh, along the way, both from in terms of what, what it is that you should design in the first place, but even more so how to actually manage this stuff. And, uh, and finally, we'll, we'll touch on a few more applications than, uh, than Peter shared about uh, applications that are, are, are starting to scale across the enterprise. Uh, and I have a lot of resource uh, suggestions for you if you want to learn more about that. How's that sound? All right, bring it on, they say. So we went in depth about mixed reality. Let's talk a little bit about virtual reality. Um, in the upper left, you see Google Cardboard. I love this because it works across devices and dirt cheap, and you can get branded uh, flat pack headsets, ship them out by the thousands. However, they're not exactly comfortable. You wouldn't want to be in one for more than three minutes. But if you want something really low cost and uh, uh, easy to use at big events or even uh, for training uh, and do branding, it's a great way to get started. Um, as well, so I'm sure you'll see some cardboard-based apps. However, if you want people to actually take them home and reuse them, you want something that's not made out of cardboard, uh, so plastic-based uh, sets can, can work. Um, as, looking at some of these other technologies, you look at the, the middle, top middle one there is the Oculus Rift. As you know, it was bought by Facebook a couple years ago for a couple billion. Um, they've got currently a tethered uh, headset at a high price point requiring a nice big computer just like the Vive, but also coming out with a more mobile, untethered, uh, lower cost version as well. See the Vive Pro is the second generation of that headset. Both of these uh, um, have um, you know, controllers to interact with. These are uh, what I would call premium classroom or it's premium VR experiences. So the highest fidelity and the most interaction because you've got some great controllers with them. But there are other ways of going about it and, and depending on what it is that you're trying to do. Uh, Gear VR is a low cost solution where the headset's about 100 and then you just need a five to 700 pound smartphone a Galaxy to put in them. Uh, it also has a controller and um, gives you decent fidelity uh, I've deployed dozens of these into the classrooms, not a bad solution. Something that's surprising to me for those looking at classroom-based solutions is people overlook the PlayStation. The headset itself uh, isn't much of an add-on. The whole cost of that setup will run you less than a gaming PC and an HTC Vive uh, as an example. However, I, I don't know of anybody actually doing that. That's a hard purchase order to write. Uh, please give me a dozen PlayStation 4s, please. Just doesn't happen in, in most companies, but very capable uh, platform um, that, that could be used. And Peter talked a lot about the mixed reality headsets coming out. What I love about that, as Peter said, is it's, it gives you a cross platform. You can develop once, deploy across HoloLens, uh, more of a VR solution, and, and use the the, um, the room with the depth sensing uh, cameras in it as well. So as, from a hardware perspective, um, those are some of the, the different ways to take you somewhere else. Let's talk a little bit more about augmented reality. And in this case, the two left examples I'm talking about are, um, are mobile uh, handset and tablet based solutions from either Google or, um, or Apple. In the upper left, I'll play a video clip. These are two technologies that have just been launched in the last uh, six months or so, uh, and you could call them competing. They're very similar. They use the camera technology in, uh, for most, mostly off-the-shelf phones, especially the Apple phones. Um, uh, on Google, right now, is running on only a, a handful of phones, but uh, you know, that'll continue to change. What's this give you? Gives you the ability to deploy to um, consumer devices, uh, which is great. 
what the now that the the handsets and tablets themselves have great graphics capabilities in them what you can do in AR on a phone because this has been out for years what you can do now is dramatically different by using a game engine such as uh, Unreal which is this top example I'm going to show you here um, you can get some really immersive uh, types of experiences uh, right here on the stage or right in your classroom where people can can walk around um, walk around that so let me show you what that looks like So this is Apple's developer conference uh, this year. Wingnut AR is Peter Jackson's uh, Thanks, AR sir. company, I guess you'd We're say. We're really excited to share an exclusive sneak peek at something we've been working on. With the AR kit, you don't need any special equipment or tracking markers, it just works. Dan's here with me from Wingnut AR, so let's take a look. Here we're using ARKit to detect the plane on the table, estimate its size, and lock our content on the surface. And since this is augmented reality, you folks are all in the shot too. So this entire 3D scene done in a game engine, just showing a level of fidelity this and animation I've never seen in AR before. Power of Unreal Engine 4. We're at a remote outpost on a desolate world. And holding up an uh, Airships would be come a here to refuel, get iPad. repairs, and to trade. <laughs> These are our townsfolk. They're expecting some visitors soon, so they're all starting to get ready for their arrival. Except for this guy down here, apparently. Who hired him? That's our airships arriving now. And what's really cool here is that with the arc, it's tracking, you can get them really close and choose how to view the action. It's like you're the director of your own experience. Oh, looks like some raiders are attacking. Oh, well, I guess that takes care of that guy. <laughs> so you can imagine gathering around in a, in a classroom, having an entire scene uh, enacted. Uh, whether it's a simulation or historical scene, and everybody being able to walk around that and interact with it and see it and, and zoom in on, on the bits that they're interested in. So we're talking about, today we're talking about uh, head-worn AR, VR, and MR. Um, but it uh, It's not to say that AR doesn't also, of course, include phones and tablets and the level of interaction and, uh, and visual fidelity that you can get on those is ever increasing. So keep your eyes tuned uh, on these platforms and because you'll continue to see them develop and, uh, and evolve. Uh, just going on a couple other things that you see up here. Um, so um, uh, the R9 smart glasses, these are uh, almost on the market, and, but they're also, they give you a, a 3D stereo uh, view. Um, the ODGs come out with R7s that have deployed in the, in the past. Uh, it's just a Android. You heard of Windows on your head. These are essentially Android on your head. Um, there's more than. There's only a selection. There's more than 30 different kinds of smart glasses on the market. Um, Google Glass came out years ago. It came out as a consumer device, and then people in the enterprise tried to adopt it. it wasn't really fit for either purpose. Kind of went underground. Has now reemerged as, as uh, Google Glass for the enterprise. So it's still kicking around, but it's. Uh, beyond, uh, it's a couple years behind, I think, of where current smart glasses are. And so as we talk about augmented reality, I'm sure you've got handheld stuff. I'm also, I'm, for the rest of this talk, really going to be focused on, on head-mounted. Um, before he has mentioned here is you're trying to develop content. You can do that with a game engine in conjunction with Vuforia that gives you that tracking um, uh, capability. So you don't necessarily have to use ARKit or uh, AR Core, there's other ways of doing that. But that's the geeky, techy developer stuff you don't need right now. Um, Peter was obviously gone into depth on HoloLens. What I'm most excited about on the transition that I'm starting to see uh, with different clients is that mix between trying VR in the classroom where we can't see each other to trying it where we can see each other and we can interact around a 3D model. And that's what excites me the most. And uh, that's one of the big differences between these two technologies. So what are some of the benefits of, of, uh, of these two um, types of technology? And a little bit more around some of the differences. I like to say with AR and MR, in terms of being um, talking about classroom use, hey, we're all in the classroom, we're still here, we can see each other, and we're interacting with content. That's what AR and MR is all about. 
With VR, we're not in the classroom anymore, we're somewhere else. Uh, we're, we're playing somebody else or we're, we're transported somewhere else. So on, on the AR side, it's a fun, engaging way to interact with content. Could be a case study, could be a model, could be some of the stuff we've already seen. We could see each other, and that's a lot better for people that don't want to be closed off, um, might be a little claustrophobic, might be scared of what they're going to look like and they can't see each other. Um, so it's, it has less inhibitions, but it's, I think it's more fun when you can interact with others. And doing multi-user VR is certainly possible and happening, but in a classroom scene, is a uh, um, uh, let me just say it's not it's not it's not as easy to do uh, to get that realism of of person to person interaction. Um, what I mean here by persistent content unlocks uh, repeat use. So you saw a 3D model um, um, on the Hololens. Um, I think you put a spaceman up there in the corner. Um, the cool thing about that technology is it always knows where it is, and every time it goes to that location, the same content you put there is still there. So if he fires this hollow lens up, that spaceman will be there. What that means is, in your training room, those of you that have set up classrooms before, you've set up the flip charts, all the little sticky notes, the pens, you go around, set up the whole thing, maybe get all the multimedia and all the devices ready. Here, the content is already there. It's just sitting wherever you've placed it in the workplace, or the classroom. Um, so it's easy to reuse. It doesn't require setting it up. But you could also let people annotate it, and that could be part of the learning experience too. Well, the challenge with that is you have to put on each HoloLens used to annotate that to go in and see what people did and erase it <laughs> for the most part. And um, so that could be a bit tricky. But the point here is once you deploy that 3D content, um, you can revisit it. So if it's a kiosk next to a piece of equipment, uh, you can go back and interact with that. And it's, it's always there. Uh, in the classroom, you're already using some multimedia. There's just another way of bringing in 3D uh, content and by letting people put on um, different um, uh, types of glasses. Some of that content could also be, instead of a 3D object, can be a, a plasma screen and LCD screens around the room that you see only when you're wearing the glasses. They can be playing video content for different people. You can have different breakout groups go to these different stations to view that content. So just another way of bringing multimedia rich content and including 3D objects into the classroom. A big difference between AR and VR is the ability to take the same hardware and use it in the workplace, so not just in the classroom. There's so many different things that you can use with, with smart glasses or, or other kinds of AR devices. So that supports both training and performance support, whereas VR pretty much, while it's being used in the design process, um, if, in some organizations is more used, uh, more going to use it in the classroom. You don't really put on a VR headset when there's people working uh, around you for the most part. There's a couple things about VR. Um, yeah, it's also fun and engaging uh, way to interact with content, but it's like being somewhere else. It's total immersion. Um, being someone else, interacting with other people, and of course, totally being transported, whether it's a skyscraper or an oil rig. Um, and that's where you're seeing a lot of the first training applications is in health and safety training of subjecting people to a dangerous environment. One of the L&D examples that I'll share here is, uh, is a very dangerous environment, and that is Black Friday in a, grocery, in a, in a Walmart in, in the US. Um, so that doesn't have to explode to be dangerous. And so I'll show that example. Um, also, you notice a lot of you uh, now are um, various levels of engagement in terms of what you, you're looking at here. Same thing with training in a, in a classroom. And you know, people check in, check out. But when you're in VR, you're totally immersed. If you're trying to get a message across, you know it's going to be received if people are putting on VR. There's no other thing you can do with your senses except pay attention. Uh, it can be very emotionally intense, but that's also a caution and concern uh, and needs to be managed. And you don't really want to scare the hell out of everybody. Worked with a client who wanted to replicate a training video they had where somebody gets hit by a truck in a construction site. Well, that could be too traumatic. How traumatic should it be? Um, so it's uh, something to, to be concerned about. Um, also in this space, in terms of VR uh, and mixed reality, um, there is uh, more off-the-shelf content for training being uh, developed. There's not much out there now, but there is a little bit, and so that can also be a, an easy way, way to, a lower cost way to get started. And we haven't mentioned much about 360 video. It's not really virtual reality, but that 360 video viewed in a VR headset is awesome, and it's dirt cheap to create. And if you're using it, say, for induction, or hey, it is what that, the place that you're gonna work is gonna look like, 
um, it's a great way to uh, get more value out of the headsets. It doesn't all have to be 3D production. So just a couple L&D examples here. We're not seeing a lot of scale yet in the use of virtual reality in the classroom uh, or mixed reality for, uh, for, for that matter, but we're starting to see it. And here's a couple of public examples. I mentioned Walmart. In the upper left, they have 200 training centers across the US. And the real, uh, I think the real reason Black Friday was termed as uh, coined, that you see here, there's Black Friday that starts like a month ahead. <laughs> so it's used for a lot of things over, over here. But in the US, Black Friday means the rampage that happens when the sh shops open. So in a Walmart, they'd say there's 10 TVs for $10 each, and there's going to be a stampede. How do you train for that? Well, you can't train on the day, all hands to deck, but they could put people in VR for that kind of an example. And that is one of the things that they're, they're starting to do. So if you search on, on, uh, on this uh, online, you'll see that they just started rolling this out, so the, um, they're excited about it, but we don't really have results yet. In the last few months, in September, uh, this MIT was made public, and the bottom left is KLM City Hopper flight crew training in a classroom. And I'll bring out some tips. Um, um, well, I have the same picture in the next slide. Tips of using it in the classroom. But this is one of the reasons why I think mixed reality, things like the HoloLens and other AR glasses, will be are better for the classroom use. Because here they've they've all got the VR headsets. And this is another one I didn't actually have on my slide, but this looks like the Google uh, Daydream that they're using. And so they're all interacting and they're all uh, immersed in there, but they can't see each other. And it's a single user experience. So it's a dozen people in a single user experience. I think that's, that's missing a trick. The middle picture uh, Peter already uh, discussed is with Pearson. Pearson gave a talk at the e-learning um, a network conference a few uh, months ago. So I saw what they're doing with, with vi volumetric video capture, which is represented in the bottom right uh, picture there. There's now a studio in partnership with Microsoft and uh, Hammerhead that's available for uh, rental, where you can create 360 video that could be used as holograms in, in, uh, in these headsets. And uh, Peter tells me you could rent it by the second. <laughs> so I, I'm sure that's uh, inexpensive. <laughs> But it sounds great. And, and how they're using it, an image I don't have, is that they've created patients. And you actually walk around the patient. And you check out the back of the patient. And you see, oh my gosh, what's on the back? And you got to diagnose it. And so it's photorealistic. I mean, it's video realistic, I guess you would say, um, interaction on these headsets. So it takes it beyond the kind of cartoony looking feel of, uh, of, um, of 3D uh, animation and uh, just makes it real video. The upper right is a dirt cheap um, camera. This one's the Ricoh Theta, I think. There's a handful of these available for like 100 quid a piece that do a decent job of up close 360 video. So we're not going to go into depth on how to create content for these things. Just wanted to plug, if you want to do high-end video on the HoloLens, there's now a studio available with over 100 cameras that shoots in ultra crazy HD um, that's available. Or you can go the uh, cheap route if you're talking about 360 video. So I mentioned um, uh, classroom use. Uh, that's where we're seeing, uh, I've been seeing a, a lot of, um, well, a lot of implementations. And so I didn't work on this KLM one, but I can use that as an example of some things to, to, to worry about, uh, to consider, to think about. Um, first of all, why would you want to be using VR or AR? So it, while you design it from an instructional design standpoint, what is it that you're trying to actually do? Where is it going to help? Be really clear on that. So for VR, it's about being somewhere that you can't really do in the classroom or experiencing something different or giving people a safe place to practice. Those are some type of things to do. The actual instruction of building that basic awareness, that basic knowledge, you can do with classroom instruction or e-learning, however you're already doing that. But be really clear on what that AR or VR experience is for. That's from the design perspective. And you guys already know that, know how to do blended learning, whatever the technology is. But that's true here. Don't just use it for fun. Make sure it has a purpose. Then, when, because you've done that, you can actually explain to people what the purpose is. So before you get everybody going on the headsets, because they're going to either be drooling or scared when they see them laid all over the counter, all over the desks. Um, be clear, hey, we're going to do this. It's going to explain, put it into context, what it's for, what they're supposed to do. Support the learners, in, in other words. How long should these things be? In my experience, you don't want them longer than 10 minutes. It's a lot of time to be spent in VR, especially for your first time. You could accomplish a lot, uh, a lot closer to, to three minutes. 
um, depending on what it is that, that you're trying to do. You want to keep it brief, especially to begin with. So your thoughts of replacing an entire e-learning module or entire day-long workshop with VR is, well, is, is nuts, I think. You want to keep it brief, short, and use it for the things that it's best at. Um, and so when you're supporting people for the first time, you, of course you've got to do your traditional train the trainer and support them, not only in what the experience is and how to run it, but how to manage the students. So one thing you see here in this picture, in the very right corner, you see somebody hands-on helping this person. Um, you want to have hands-on support, and if you have a dozen or even two dozen headsets in the room, you need more than one person. And how do you support the learners? You want to build their confidence, build their, um, reduce their fear of trying this stuff, um, tell them how it's going to be. Um, you want to figure out how are you going to get them into the experience. And, and so what I mean by supporting scene coordination, uh, or starting scene coordination in kiosk mode, if you just put on the headset and you have to walk 12 people through how to get to the application, you're doomed because you don't, can't see what it is all 12 of them are doing. So it's better to have some kind of the, the software program to actually launch directly into what it is that you want them to do. When it's more of a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two, you can keep asking, what do you see? Some of the learning that, uh, that I had in a project with London Business School is what they tried to do is turn around and make a, a broadcaster. So like Peter is gonna, it was broadcasting his HoloLens, you could do that with VR too, so that you can see what it is that they're looking at. There's other things you can do from a support perspective, and that is if you're gonna network these together to see what it is that they're doing, um, you can monitor progress that way. You could also monitor progress by programming in an app that says what screen they're in, what their battery life is, and, and so forth. Um, so I mentioned about monitoring progress. It's great if you can have at least one of the devices simulcast. It's great if you could show people on a screen what it is that they're going to view. Assessment. Um, you can build in a quiz and reporting scores if you want, um, but you need to think through those ahead of time. It's a lot cheaper, easier, faster to simply do a verbal debrief like you would do usually uh, as well. So it doesn't have to necessarily have assessment. It can be just an experience that's debriefed. Um, with battery life, think about a dozen or more devices in a room, especially devices like this. Where are you going to charge them? How are you going to make sure that they're charged up? Where do all the wires go? Where do they go to get charged? Are they charged before you get started? Because if you haven't charged up these devices, they take more than enough, uh, more than the hour that you have before the workshop to get them to run until lunchtime. So it's just part of the logistics that you need to plan ahead. Um, and then having some way to monitor multiple uh, units. Battery life can be helpful, so you've got a backup plan. Finally, around portability, some want to use the HTC Vive and, and switch, move it between classrooms. Um, the challenge with that is it has external sensors that you got to move with you and calibrate it every time, which, if you don't have direct uh, hands-on tech support, is a bit tedious. So another, if you want those kinds of controllers and that experience, using something more like the Rift, uh, makes sense, so, or uh, even uh, Gear VR. So if it's portable that you need, um, you think through how portable some of the different systems are, but then also networking. If you are going to point to the cloud, are you going to be able to do that in your app? Um, are you going to be able to set up a local network um, if you're doing multi-user? So just kind of the basic things of deploying any kind of simulation uh, hardware. Uh, finally, this is my last slide before we have a little bit of time for questions. And what are some of the other applications? And so um, if you um, look, all the examples on the right are li actually live links when you get the slides to these different organizations to learn more about enterprise applications beyond L&D. But uh, what I will say is that product design is one of the hottest areas right now for VR, mixed reality, and, and, and augmented reality. And this picture you see here uh, is a McLaren. McLaren have been um, uh, pioneers in using different technologies to visualize uh, their product for both consumer configuration, for maintenance and training of installation, um, repairs, that kind of thing, but also for cab design. And at a conference, uh, they brought one of their fiberglass um, or fi carbon fiber 
uh, bucks, they call them, where it was empty, you put on the VR and you can instantly switch between different dashboards. So now they have a rapid prototyping uh, element. And what they said is, you've got to sit in there to have that immersion of what the, what the actual cockpit will feel like and then change the visuals. So you see a lot of work happening in product design, both for exteriors and interiors. Architecture, you see much more around design, but what's this going to look like? So augmented reality, visualization of what this building is going to be like in a, in a certain area. Um, construction, same thing, but also how are these things going to come together uh, for, for a large scale plant. Maintenance and repair, a lot of work I've been doing in 3D aircraft maintenance training was in both AR but also VR training. Marketing uh, product launches are now happening in, in, in uh, VR, and so JLR's new iCar or iPACE was launched this way uh, to, uh, to the uh, trade press, and there's of course a lot more out there. And then consumer engagement, how, uh, how are people, how are, how are all of us being uh, influenced in, uh, by different AR apps? If you think about it, one of the things that IKEA is uh, going to town on with the AR core, our AR kit, again, mixed up. Uh, anyway, um, IKEA putting their furniture into your house and uh, being able to s see how that'll look. There's a bunch of those types of apps out there and, and even more coming. So the point here is you, you guys, a lot of you work in big organizations that are playing more in this space, consumer facing or in product design that are using these technologies. And so it makes sense to help educate the rest of the business about the technologies and use these technologies yourselves to um, uh, to help train uh, your own staff and, of course, yourselves. So those are the few things that I wanted to talk about. Uh, these are some great resources. Uh, the VR Learns from the Macy Center uh, area is uh, augmentedrealityenterprise.org, something like that, and a lot of examples there. Immerse UK um, uh, have a lot of events going on and a lot of both training and non-training applications. Uh, the Harvard Business Review, uh, plug in that again, great article around AR and develop 3D adds quite a few resources on enterprise uh, applications. So just wanted to leave you with some resources, then uh, open it up for some Q&A. Thank, Thank you. So we've got time probably for a couple of questions. I'm, my brain's buzzing, because I'm just thinking <laughs> of okay, how can I use this and so on. Um, gentlemen there, please. Moving from flat screens or flat UI to 3D space uh, experience, so what are the, do you have already insights about what changes we have to make about these UI and user experiences from what you've seen? Yeah, sure. I mean, we're just moving towards a more natural scenario, right, where we can, uh, you know, design things more or less with our hands, with the controllers. Whereas, you know, you saw my slide earlier with the, when I was animating the cube. Um, recently, my daughter went into virtual reality and she, she used a, some software and she built a house in 3D. That would take her 20 years to do that in the, in, um, in the 3D software. So it's just, you know, it's just a completely natural way to interact, really. So, but do we have to switch the way because we kind of maybe already focus on how to do two-dimensional UI, so yes. We, we yeah, should, maybe. Yeah, it's a bit design it for our organizations, what should we about? Well, I mean, those things are going to take time, right? So there's going to be a lot of crossover while those things are changing. But yeah, it's just unfortunate for the people that have learned how to use those uh, 2D paradigms, I would say. I think it's a, that's a really interesting question because um, you know, a lot of the examples that you were quoting and you were showing us show these things happening in schools. You know, in five years' time, they're going to be our employees. So they're going to be walking in expecting to be able to do the same kind of stuff. And what are we going to do? Plop them in front of a laptop, you know, with a bit of Wi-Fi and, you know, one, well, we say this, but, but the, you know, my son left school, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, and he has a good, strong use of technology. He's now gone into an employer that's using, you know, Windows Vista. You know, it's, you know, there's a challenge there for us, I think, in terms of how is the technology in the workplace mirroring technology within education? Yeah, I mean, what I'd say is just becoming more and more natural. Right? We're speaking to our computer. Our computers are you know, becoming more contextual. They understand our environment. They understand what we want. They, they know I've got a meeting. They know the traffic's bad. And it's just becoming more and more natural way to in interact with them, especially with 3D, because you just interact with things as you would in the physical world. 
Well, we've got one more question. So I say a hand over here somewhere. A gentleman at the far end there. This microphone just coming to you. Thank you. Just a, a quick question. Is, is, uh, is the physiological effect, is VR nausea significant one? And are there design tips for dealing with that in the, with the, with the UI and your user experience? Please. Sure. Um, from a VR perspective, you can get simulation sickness quite easily. If you go down to the trade show down there and you try a lot of headsets on, you will get that will occur. And because it is a design consideration, you've got to have the frame rate high and not have it dip down, no matter what the simulation is, VR or not. So that is one, one issue. Um, there's certain things to not do, or at least not start with, and that is moving yourself through a scene uh, when your body's not moving. That causes that like that. And um, 360 video that's um, moving you around or those roller coaster sims, just move the body too much, uh, move the eyes, the brain too much without the body moving, and that causes it. So there, there are definitely design considerations, a lot being published on how to design to, to minimize that. And there's a, a certain percentage of the population that are more susceptible to, to this than others. And for those, no matter what you do, they're still gonna feel um, nauseous, uh, and for that, you've got to have a backup plan. If, if that part, if you get to the stage where you've made this a full-scale implementation, you've got to have a backup for people that hate VR or just get seasick, uh, motion, uh, sim sick uh, with it. You need a backup plan. Okay, um, we're out of time, unfortunately. Uh, once again, I'd like to say uh, if you could just express your, your thanks again for Juan Edwards and Peter Dokonitis. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.